souls. It seems just about everyone these days. Not everyone's form is perfect. offers everyone good, clean fun. Honestly, I suggest that you purchase your own ball as soon as possible. It'll help you to become a better bowler. The pro shop at your local center will help you to select the ball, fit it to your hand, and drill it. A custom fitted ball will help add pins to your score. The second most important piece of equipment in the game of bowling is the shoes. Bowling centers offer a large selection of shoes available in all sizes. However, if you're a more serious bowler and would like to purchase shoes, let me make a few suggestions. Buy yourself a good quality pair of shoes. They may cost you a few dollars more, but remember, the best bowling equipment will pay off in comfort and in higher scores. Bowling shoes are designed to serve two vital functions. As you can see, one shoe has an all leather sole designed to allow an easy slide to the line. The other shoe is mostly all rubber and is designed to act as a brake. Remember, good footwork is the solid foundation of a good game and a good pair of shoes are necessary to good footwork. Conditioning for bowling should be a year-round job. Let's take a look at a program of simple conditioning and training exercises you can do in your own home or at the office. This program of exercises only takes a few minutes every day. It helps to develop flexibility, endurance, and strength. In bowling, your legs take the most wear and tear. So let me suggest two exercises for your legs. In this exercise, Lean against the wall with your arms at shoulder height. Gradually move your legs backward, maintaining a straight body position. Now you can feel the tension in the back of the legs. Now we'll show you an exercise called the crossover toe touch. Simply take your right foot, cross it over your left, bend down and touch your toes. Do this several times and then repeat it with your left foot. Take your left foot, cross it over the right, and bend down. Every bowler knows how important the fingers are when bowling. Here's one of my secrets. I carry around a little rubber ball with me. I squeeze it every chance I get. You'll be surprised how this simple exercise can give you such big results. Remember, strong fingers means a stronger grip. Let's talk about isometric exercises. When used regularly, they're a marvelous way to improve your overall physical condition. And the wonderful thing about isometric exercises is that they can be used almost anywhere at any time. On each of the following exercises I'm about to show you, I recommend that you time yourself by counting seconds, 1,001, 1,002, and so on. Try to hold each exercise for a minimum of six seconds, then relax and repeat the exercise. Try to do 10 repetitions of each. The first exercise I'm going to show you is the hand press. It's done by placing the open palm of your left hand on top of the right open palm of your bowling hand. Press down firmly with your left hand while pulling upward with an equal amount of pressure from your right hand. Hold it for six seconds, relax, and then repeat it 10 times. 
The next exercise is called the hooked finger pull. It's done by taking the fingers of the left hand and the right hand, hooking them together, keeping your arms at about chest height, and pulling firmly. You'll feel your wrist and your fingers strengthening in this exercise. Hold it for six seconds, then relax and repeat it for 10 repetitions. This isometric exercise is especially aimed at strengthening the third and fourth fingers of the bowler's hand. It's done by placing the third, fourth, and fifth fingers below the open palm of the left hand with the forefinger extended above the left hand. Next, press down with your left hand and pull up with an equal amount of pressure by your right hand. This will strengthen your third and fourth fingers and these are the fingers you need for that extra power at the release. Remember, you can do isometric exercises just about anywhere at any time. You can do them in your car, at work, or in your living room while watching TV. In fact, the more you experiment with isometrics, the more you'll come to enjoy them. Let me make two more suggestions. These are exercises you can do in your own home. Pick up your bowling bag with the ball in it. It weighs about 20 pounds. Bend over slightly and swing it in front of you. This is a good exercise for your shoulder muscles, and also it loosens up the muscles. Right up here you can feel it real good. Secondly, swing it as if you're bowling. This is also a very good exercise for your shoulder muscles. It also gives you good rhythm and timing. Before we actually bowl, let's learn how to read the lane. Let's find out what the markings are, what they're used for, and how we can use them to our benefit to help us become a better bowler. When you step up on the approach of a lane, you'll notice two sets of dots, with five dots, sometimes seven, in each row. The purpose of these dots is to aid you in lining up your feet when you take your starting position. When you first position yourself into your stance, Look down and take note as to where your feet are in relation to the dots. Then when you find your best starting position for you, you can use these dots as a guideline to help you put your feet in the same mark every time. After you have finished your approach and released the ball, look down again. You'll notice another set of dots. This is the third and final set of markings on the approach and they're located a couple of inches behind the foul line. Make a mental note as to where your sliding foot finishes and try to hit the same mark each time. Remember, learn to start and finish your approach at the same mark. Next we have the foul line. It separates the approach from the actual lane. And remember, don't let your feet or any other part of your body go over the foul line and touch the lane, or as the name indicates, you'll foul and receive zero for that ball. Past the foul line is the actual lane itself. It's constructed of 40 boards, be numbered 1 through 40 with the center board number 20. Right-handers count from the right side 1 to 40. Left-handers can count from the left side 1 to 40. Approximately 6 to 8 feet past the foul line, you'll notice two sets of five dots each. They're numbered 3, 5, 8, 11, and 14, counting from either side of the lane. Just past the lane dots, approximately 15 feet down the lane, you'll find a series of seven large arrows. Let's call these targeting arrows. They're placed five boards apart with the center arrow on board 20. And together with the lane dots, you can use these as aiming or targeting devices. Many people find it easier to use a target a few feet away rather than 60 feet away. Learn to use these lane dots and arrows as aiming devices. And now, let's take a look at the basics, or the mechanics of bowling. There are four actions that are required here. They are the stance, the approach, the release of the ball, and the follow-through. Remember that everyone is different. 
No two people have the same starting position or the same finishing position. If you're a beginner, it may take you a while to discover the best starting position for yourself. Only trial and error will help you to determine the best spot. But once you find that exact starting position, you're ready to get into your stance. First, line your feet up square to the foul line. Then I suggest you put your left foot a little bit in front of your right foot. This is good for balance. Then, bend your knees slightly, keeping your upper body fairly erect. But remember, be relaxed. It's very important here to make sure that your feet, your shoulders, and your body are square to the line. Look down, give yourself a quick check. Next, hold the ball in the center of your body with both hands, with your elbows close to your side. The key word here is relaxation. Remember, be relaxed. And now, let's take a look at the approach. In your approach to the foul line, there are two basic approaches, the four-step and the five-step. Let me show you some tips on the four-step approach. My basic theory is to remember four key words, out, down, back, and slide. If you remember these four words, the four-step approach is going to be very easy. On the first one, the first step goes out along with the ball. That is out. Again, the ball and the step out at the same time. The second step goes forward, and the ball is down by your side. The third step is next, and the ball is in its height of its backswing. And next is the slide, and the ball is released. Now, let's see this in full motion. Remember, the most important part of a four-step approach is that the push away and the first step go out at the same time. Again, the most important part, remember, ball and the step at the same time. Step one, the ball goes out. Step two, the ball goes down. Step three, the ball goes back. And step four is the slide. Now I will show you the five step. The four step and the five step are very similar. The only difference is in a five step approach, you hold the ball for one step. The left foot starts first and then you move. Let me demonstrate that. Step one, you hold the ball. Step two, the ball goes out at the same time as you step. Step three, the ball goes down. Step four, the ball goes back. Step five is the slide and the ball is released. Now I will show you the proper delivery. Your fingers should be directly underneath the ball with your thumb approximately at one o'clock. Your thumb comes out of the ball first your fingers rotate slightly around the ball for good lift and power. Also, the follow through, which is very important. The follow through should be a long extension reaching out over the lane, reaching for your mark. The most important thing in throwing strikes is hitting the pocket. But first, let me explain what a pocket is. Two pins side by side, for instance, the 1-3, three, the 3-6, three, six, the 6-10, six, those are the three pockets on the right side. The 1-2, two, the 2-4, the 4-7, those are the three pockets on the left side. 
The strike pocket for a right-hander is the one three, where the yellow arrow is pointing. The strike pocket for a left-hander is the one two, where the blue arrow is pointing. Now let's talk about throwing strikes. Everyone wants to throw strikes. I'm gonna show you how to get lined up and throw strikes consistently. For right-handers, second arrow, which is on the 10th board, is the most common target to throw your ball over in order to hit the 1-3 pocket. Left-handers would reverse this, throw over the second arrow from the left to hit their strike pocket, which is the 1-2. No matter where I line up my feet in my starting position, I will always throw over the second arrow. First of all, we're going to put our left foot on the 18th board, throw the ball over second arrow, and see where it hits. We see that that ball went high. We were standing on 18. This time, let's move a little bit to the left. You always adjust. You move to the direction in which the ball went. The ball went a little bit left of the pocket. You move your feet further left. So this time, let's move four boards and stand on 22. We will stand on 22, moving four boards left with our feet using the same Strike target, the second arrow. All right, that ball went a little light. So now let's move back a little bit. Let's, let's compromise. We stood on 22. We stood on 18. Let's compromise. We'll stand on 20 this time. The ball should hit the pocket. That was a good shot. The shot hit the pocket. Now, to make sure that we've made a real good shot, let's stand in the same place again, stand on 20, throw the ball over the second arrow. If the ball hits the pocket again, we know that we've got it. Okay, we did it again. Now we know we're lined up to throw strikes. Now you should be able to stand in the same place every time, hit the second arrow, and throw strikes consistently. Let's review what we have just learned. Everyone is different. For me, standing on 20, throwing over the second arrow works. It doesn't matter where you stand in your starting position as long as you remember these rules. We have just learned how to line up to throw strikes. Through a very simple system, I will teach you how to make most common spares. First, I will show you the spare leave, and then I will demonstrate it for you. There's a simple system for shooting spares. We're gonna explain that system to you now. The 1-3, three, the 3-6, three, six, the 6-10, six, those are the three pockets on the right side. The 1-2, two, 
the 2-4, four, the 4-7, four, those are the three pockets on the left side. If your strike target is standing on 20 and throwing over the second arrow, in order to hit the 3-6, you would move five boards to the left. In order to hit the 6-10, I suggest you move an additional six boards. Now going back to the beginning, you're standing on 20 for the strike pocket. In order to hit the 1-2, you move five boards to the right. To hit the 2-4, move an additional four boards to the right. To shoot the 4-7, move an additional three boards. The reason that you move less boards going right is that the ball is going across the lane and the ball have a tendency to hook a little more. This is a very common spare, the 4-7. When shooting for the 4-7, the ball should enter at this point, just to the left of the 4-pin. Now let me show you how. Now shooting the 4-7, you would move 12 boards right with your feet off your strike target, which was 20. Another very common spare is the 3-6. When shooting the 3-6, the ball should enter at this point, directly between the three and the six, as the arrow shows. Now I'm gonna show you how to cover the three six. You would move six boards left with your feet off your strike target. The reason that we move six and not five is because you don't wanna chop the spare, so you don't wanna take that chance. Move an extra board to the left, so you hit the three pin just a little bit lighter. This spare is a little bit more difficult, the 610. The 610 is very easy to chop. When shooting the spare, you want to have the ball enter between the two pins. Now I will demonstrate how to convert the 610. Again, we're moving off the strike target. This is the third pocket on the right. You would move 11 boards left with your feet Moving on to a very common cluster spare, it's the one, two, four. When shooting the spare, you want to enter on the left side of the head pin, as the arrow shows you. Now let me show you how to hit it. Now we're going to show you how to make the one, two, four. Simply move five boards right off your strike target with your feet. This is the most difficult of the clusters, the 2458. It's called the bucket. This spare is very easy to chop. The reason of this is a lot of times people hit it just a little bit too high and they will send the two pins straight back and leave the five. The other reason it's real easy to miss is sometimes they'll hit it too light, take out these three pins and leave the eight. In shooting this, the ball should enter right between the two and the five, high on the spare. If the ball enters here, it'll take out all four pins. Next, we're going to show you how to make the 2458, better known as the bucket. Off your strike target, you would move four boards right with your feet. This is the most common of all splits, the 310. It's called the baby split. In order to make this split, what you want to do is you want to have the ball hit directly between the two pins, entering where this arrow is pointing. The next one I would like to demonstrate is a 310. 310 is known as a baby split. You would move seven boards left with your feet. Seven boards because if you were to move Five boards, that would be the three six, but you want to hit the three pin very light, so move an extra two boards.
This is the most common of all pocket splits, the 5-7. In shooting the 5-7, you want to hit the 5 very light over here, send the pin into the 7. And this will become a very easy split after you learn how to do that. Let me show you how to make the 5-7, a very common pocket split. You would move two and a half boards left with your feet. This is one of the toughest splits, the 6-7-10. In making the 6-7-10, you want to hit the 6 very light right over here. This will take the 6 into the 7, and the ball will take out the 10. This is a very tricky split. Let me show you how to make it. The 6-7-10, a much more difficult spare. You would move 13 boards left off your strike target. The 610 would be 11 boards. But you want to hit the 6 pin very light on the right side to slide it into the 7 so you would move 13 boards. This is the toughest of all splits, the 7-10. The odds of making this split is about 1 million to 1. In shooting for this, pick the pin that is easiest for you to hit. For me, it's a 10 pin. Just take the ball and throw it very hard at it and hope that you get a lucky kick and it bounces out and goes into the other pin. Let me see if I can make it. The 7-10, the toughest splitting bowling. You would move 13 boards left with your feet. As you remember, I said it was a million to one, and the chances of making this are very slim. So just take the ball and throw the ball right at the 10 pin and hope you get a lucky break. One of the most frequent and serious faults that many bowlers face is an improper backswing. If your backswing is too high, you'll have a problem of controlling the ball. The most common reason for a high backswing is that many bowlers push the ball up and away from their bodies, hoping for more power. This will only throw your timing and balance off and cause you to have too much backswing. The solution is to lower your push away at the start of your swing. The push away should go out and down, not up and out. This should give you the proper backswing. Many women face the problem of a low backswing. It's usually because they are not as physically strong as a man. Again, the usual fault is with the push away. Make sure your arms are fully extended at the end of your push away. This should give you the momentum necessary for the proper backswing. Another solution might be to use a lighter ball. The proper backswing should be approximately shoulder high. There are many things that can go wrong with your footwork during your approach. Drifting is one of the more common faults when it comes to your footwork. As the name implies, 
Drifting is the tendency to wander slightly to the right or the left when approaching the foul line, instead of following a straight path. Remember, your first step is the most important step. If your first step is off to the left or right, then you have immediately destroyed your squareness to the line and your entire approach will be off. If you have a problem with drifting, then let me make a suggestion. Place a piece of tape on the floor stretching out in a straight line for about 10 feet as you see demonstrated here. You can do this at home or at the office. Then practice making the first step of your delivery, making sure that your foot hits the correct spot each time. After you have the first step straightened out, continue with the other steps of your delivery. After some practice, this will help you immensely and it should correct the problem of drifting. Another problem of faulty footwork is rushing the line. This is usually caused by footwork that is too fast. It will cause your body to get ahead of the ball and your arm never has a chance to catch up, resulting in a bad throw. There is only one solution for rushing the line. Consciously slow down your approach. Remember what I said before. Your first step is the most important step. Take your first step slowly and deliberately and make a conscious attempt to slow yourself down. If you find yourself having trouble for any reason at any time, I have a simple checklist that you can go over to help you solve all your problems. Number one, ask yourself, is my wrist firm with a thumb on the inside pointing toward my usual thumb clock position, which is 10 or 11 o'clock? Is my grip secure, firm, but relaxed? Number two, I will check my starting position and my finishing position. Am I drifting right or left? Have I moved my starting position or my target at the line without realizing it? Number three, am I rushing the line? Am I sliding straight at the line? Number four, have I increased the speed of the ball or slowed it down without realizing it? Number five, am I actually seeing the ball go over its target on the lane or am I pulling out of the ball, cutting short my follow through? Number six, am I pointing the ball into the head pin, trying to aim the ball rather than let it roll? Number seven, is my elbow wandering from my body causing a sidearm or topping of the ball? Number eight, am I dropping the ball before I get it out over the foul line or am I lofting the ball too far over the foul line? Ninth, am I taking into consideration the fact that the lanes may be hooking more than they were at the start? Should I change my line or target? Finally, number 10, I resolve to be more deliberate and take my time about each successive delivery. Thanks for joining us on Practice Makes Perfect, the Bowling Masters. I'm Wayne Webb. And I'm Lisa Wagner. I hope you've enjoyed this program as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. And remember, practice, practice does, does make perfect. perfect.